but at 2 o'clock, you guys are going to be a little, uh, a little grouchy, I think. There you go. <laughs> um, you know, this has been a, you know, a great, great week. I appreciate it again. I just I want to thank everybody for all the, the support um, that you have given Rachel and I. Uh, we always we announced last week about our uh, about Rachel being pregnant. Um, the the amount of love that has come from you guys has been uh, more than we could ever ask for, uh, and we just we are so grateful um, for where God has placed us in life, which is right here with you guys, and that is uh, truly a blessing for us. Um, I don't want I want to tell you something that happened uh, from someone someone in here that blessed us, um, and I'm going to try not to cry. Uh, but, you know, a couple weeks ago I testified about the, uh, the tires, the tire situation we had, and then uh, we, had, we had gotten some money back, and then there was, a, we sold it, we were basically $200 short of, of putting our emergency fund back to where uh, we had had it before the tires happened. And I walked into my office on, I think it was Tuesday, Tuesday morning or Tuesday afternoon, and there was an envelope um, underneath my door, someone had stuck $200 in cash uh, underneath my door. So I just want to publicly say thank you to whoever that was. Um, I, 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 I said I, Rachel was in Cedar Rapids. She was on a trip in Atlanta. That's what she was doing. And I took a picture of, of the envelope and, and the money, and I sent it to her. And she and it was a bad move on my part because she was in the middle of meetings and gets this picture of this, and, and it says, you know, for our generation. And, and she said, that was the worst time you could have ever said that to me because she started walking. I just want you to know how much we love you guys and how much we appreciate everything that you guys do for us. Um, I, just, I, I could not ask for a better place to be. Um, and I just want, want you to know that that is so vital for, for me as um, a great husband uh, that she is extremely happy here. Um, a lot of pastor's wives don't have that much. Um, I, know, I know way too many pastor's wives who, uh, who don't enjoy what their, what their husband does um, or they've lost that energy, that spunk, that, you know, whatever made them alive before. Um, ministry usually takes the hardest toll on pastor's wife. And so while she's not here, uh, I want you to know how much I appreciate how you take care of her um, and you love her. And uh, if that means more to me than anything you can ever do for me, uh, is please continue to take care of her as well as you do. Um, it's truly a blessing. So thank you. Publicly thank you. Uh, now we'll get into our message today. Uh, uh, as you know, I'm preaching on the, the title of the series that we were talking about is saying yes. Yes. Saying yes to Jesus. Uh, we're leading up to Easter, Jesus on the cross, dying on the cross for our sins. And all we have to do, say yes. Okay? Now, it gets, it's, it's a little more difficult than that, I think, when we live our lives. We have uh, situations that come up in our life. We have problems. We have what, you know, relationship issues, financial problems, job problems. Um, health issues, all those things make it difficult to say yes sometimes because we become so distracted by the problems of the world, and that's a tool of the devil. I want you to know that. I hope you agree with that. Um, and we become so caught up in the details of, of a bad situation <coughs> that we stop focusing on who God is and what Jesus has done on the cross for our lives to be saved. And so the, this, this last week was, uh, we talked about being, um, uh, no, I'm losing my, losing my mind here. Uh, we talked about not trusting, uh, being in disbelief, um, I, you lack belief or someone not believing in you, what you say. And then we pointed out where Jesus had that exact same thing happen to him. He had died on the cross. He had risen from the dead. And he was walking around this earth. Uh, if, so, if, that, if, if someone that you knew died, and then three days later was walking around again and talking to you, you would probably believe pretty much anything they said, right? Like that's, uh, that's pretty amazing stuff. That would yeah, be hard to deny some awesomeness there. And yet the disciples even had to see Jesus, had to, had to feel his hands and his side. They had to see in order to believe. So Jesus was down even after he raised from the dead. And so, of course, we in this world are going to be doubted as we share our faith with people around us. That is to be expected. And yet we can be confident in our own faith. No matter what happens out there, 
God, we know that God is going to show up at just the right time. Not in our definition of the right time, but in His definition of the right time. And so be confident in that. Be um, confident in God um, that, that your faith is not misplaced in Him. So we're from being doubted to being confident. Today we're going from being grieved to being comforted. Okay? You guys ever been grieved before for somebody, a uh, loved one, um, child? Uh, they're, they're going through a hard time, and you just, man, you, if they would just do this, they get it figured out, right? You want to shake them like a rag doll, smack them around a few times, and just say, get it together, dude. And they, everything they do fights against that. Fight against what you're trying to do, try to help them, what you know they can do. How much more so do you think Jesus grieves for us. And we read a story about that in Matthew chapter 20, uh, 23, sorry, Matthew chapter 23. If you would stand with me while we read this passage, just a couple of verses will make you stand long. Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. Jesus is talking here. Uh, and he has just gone through, the title of this passage, chapter 23, is The Seven Woes. He's just gone through it, saying all of these horrible things that are going to happen uh, to some of these people uh, who are sinners, who are a lot of the, 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 the religious people of the time, the Pharisees, etc. When we get to the end of this passage, verse 37, and we find Jesus' real heart for these people. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you are not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Thank you. You may be seated. Jesus was grieved for the people of Jerusalem. He was distraught. And he had just got done saying all the negative things that were going to happen to him, like more very, very matter of fact, like this... I'll just pick one out. Uh, verse 27 says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything that is unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. He was very blunt and to the point and said, This is what you are. And how many times do we have that feeling that we want to say that to the people in our lives that are just not turning to Jesus and they're just, they're fighting it with everything they have and they want to uh, just do their own thing, go their own way and, and even some of them they come to church right? Some of the people that we pray for the hardest are people that still come to church every Sunday but on Monday, Tuesday and every other day of the week you couldn't tell one thing about their Christian lives there's no spiritual discipline. There's no Bible reading. There's no prayer time. There's no fellowship with other Christians. They come to church out of a sense of duty. They come to church out of a sense of family loyalty. And Jesus just got done telling these Pharisees, these religious people of the time, teachers of the law, he said they were whitewashed tombs. They're hypocrites. They're pretty on the outside, disgusting on the inside. And we grieve people like that. And I just want to share with you as a, a from a pastor's heart, and this is this is new to me. I'm, I'm, I'm still fairly new in this role, but I have seen pastors who have grieved desperately for the people that sit in their pews every Sunday in the morning because they know what's going on in their lives throughout the day. I'll tell you, uh, if you remember Pastor, pastor Dan, who came for our revival, and he was my pastor when I was a child. He, uh, I was too young to know about this when, I, when this happened, but there was a man... In our church, his name is Doug. Uh, he was a practicing uh, homosexual, um, and he was coming to church. And there was no judgment. They were, they were coming to church. They were trying to. You, Dan was working with him and doing a great job. And, and Doug was. I'm sorry, he had been practicing, and he had stopped. Um, and he had worked with this man for so long, and so long, and so long. And there came a point in time, and Dan. This is years later that Dan shared this with me. Um, when I was getting ready to come into ministry, he just says a story. And he said, there, there came a point in time where I could tell that his worship was different because he had gone back into that lifestyle and was trying to hide it from everybody in the church. And so you could tell there was a change 
in the way he was living his life, the way he was interacting with people, and so forth. So, so from a pastor's standpoint, pastors notice that thing. Notice those kinds of Sunday school teachers notice those kinds of things. They can tell when something has changed just a little bit, and it affects worship. It affects fellowship. It affects the ability to, to really connect with each other. And so he goes on, and, and Dan, Dan had, had uh, knew where to go to find the uh, um, on certain nights of the week um, when certain bars were open. And Dan, as a pastor, uh, in, back in the 1980s, walked into one of those places and uh, found him there. And he basically said, you're coming with me now, and we're going to get the same taken care of. You're going you're gonna to settle the question. You're going to make this done and get this right. And he walked out of that bar and has never walked back since. And I know he now works in California as uh, for an uh, organization that helps aid people in that lifestyle um, who have given their lives to Christ but are still struggling with that. So um, anyone who tells me that that you're born that way, um, I tell you the love of God. I'm not. I wouldn't deny that you were born that way. But I was. I was born uh, with an addictive personality, and I'll show you many things in my life that have uh, led me down a path of sin because of that. But God has changed me. Jesus has changed me. And that's the same thing for that lifestyle. So there's no, there's no judgment. Um, there's no uh, hatred. There's no anything like that. It's a matter of are you letting God change you into, one, into who He has called you to be. Okay. That is hypocrisy, though. We see it and we grieve for it. Now, obviously, we grieve for our friends and loved ones and uh, family members, people that we know who are struggling uh, who do not who have not come to Christ, who do not I mean, we, those people we want to shake as well. But isn't it worse so for the people that you know know the truth? Like they, they you've been you've gone to church with them for 20 years, and you see them making these decisions, and you just want to smack them across the face with a good backhand and tell them, wake up! You are living a life that is grieving God, that grieves. Jesus. And as your brother or sister in Christ, it is grieving me. Are we afraid to share that with each other? Are you afraid to share that with your family members who may go to a different church, whatever? Are you willing to share with them your heart? Jesus laid it out for us right here. He was blunt. He was to the point. He told them what they were doing wrong. And again, remember, these are not, these are not unsafe people. These are, these are the religious people. These were the people that were going to the synagogues, that were worshiping. And he called them these things. And then he says, How often I have longed to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. You were not willing. That's the grievous part. Are you willing? If you're someone that you know, you're grieving the Holy Spirit right now, you're grieving God, you're grieving the people around you, because you say you love Jesus, you say that God is real, but your life does not reflect that reality, you are grieving God. And it is time to let Him protect you as the mother hen protects her chicks. It is time to let Him draw you into His arms so that you can be comfortable, so that you can be that you can know him, just like we talked about with Jeremiah 29, 13. You will seek me and you will find me and you will know that I love you. No. That's true protection. That's true love. That's true freedom. It doesn't matter what happens to us. We can lose our job. We can, uh, we, can, we can have tragedy in our families. We can have all these kinds of things that, that can tear a person's life on this earth apart. And beyond all of that, we can still have security in the arms of Jesus. We can still have safety in the arms of Jesus. Uh, I love the story of, of, of the disciples um, on the boat. Uh, the, the, the waves and the water is going nuts. And the disciples are freaking out, right? We, do you ever freak out in your life when things are going crazy? When the storms of life are battering around you and you just... Can't take it. You're saying, Jesus, where are you at? Wake up. Come on. Are you even paying attention? And that's in essence what the disciples did there. Jesus was, Jesus was taking a nice little nap. 
He was comfortable. He was fun. And the disciples come down there and they shake him away. And they say, fix this problem. We're going to drown. And Jesus gets up, calms the wind and the waves. But then he turns and looks at him and he says, why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? Did they have a reason to be afraid? Okay. The boat could have sunk. They could have drowned. They could have died. But what would have happened then? They would have been in heaven with God. Why are you afraid? Why do you not trust in the eternity of heaven? Or do you allow yourself to get so overwhelmed to be concerned with the details of what's going on right here and now. God's concerned about the little things, about the details, but not more so than what's going to happen when this life is over. Do not let that, the little details of life, beat you down so much that you lose sight of heaven, that you lose sight of what our goal is. Uh, Trevor talked about it in our Sunday school class, to run the race with perseverance. Uh, the, the race, this life, it has a goal line, right? We're, we're striving to get to the end. We want to get there focusing on God. So the question is, two questions. Are you grieving God yourself? Are you a whitewashed tomb? Pretty on the outside. Everybody thinks you're great. Everybody thinks you're an awesome Christian. But on the inside, you know that there's something in your life that is keeping you separated from true worship, from loving God and knowing His love for you. John chapter 20, verses 10 through 18. I'll give you a second to get there. You don't need to stand up. So this is just a story of someone being comforted by Jesus. And again, an example of Jesus showing up right on time. John chapter 20, verse 10. It says, Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, the best, or sorry, as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken the Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned to him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbi, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told him that he had said these things to her. <coughs> I get choked up just reading that verse that says, Jesus said to her, Mary, God is calling your name. God is calling you personally. He's saying, do you want to do that? The God of the you, the God who created all of that beauty out there, knows you. He knows you personally. He knows you better than you know yourself. That is an awesome thing. I was reading a, a, a thing, I, don't, I think it was this morning, uh, before, before I came over here, and it said, it was just a simple uh, tweet, and it said, um, an interesting way to look at the Creator. We look at it biblically. My father and my brother created the universe. Right? God, our father, we are brothers in Christ. In Christ. He created the universe. That's how important you are. You are adopted into the family of the ones who created the world. That's comforting to me. Are you grieved for someone today? whether it's a, 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 an unsaved loved one or friend or family member, or someone who you know is in the church and not living the way that they should be living, are you grieved this morning? 
Jesus can comfort you. Jesus can make it so that you can have peace in your life. Peace, freedom of mind, to continue to worship Him appropriately and pray for those who are grieving you and who you know are grieving God. But be comforted this morning. Do not let the details of this life, even your loved ones and their salvation, rob you of yours. Do not let them and their lives, the way they are choosing to go about their free will, to use their free will, don't let that rob you of what you know to be true and what you know to be correct and right and that God loves you and died on the cross and His Son died on the cross for you. Let that comfort you today. Let that be something that takes away all of the cares so that you can truly worship Him. Him alone. He is an audience of one. Have you ever heard that, that phrase? He is an audience of one. Everything that you do, He is the only one you should be concerned about. He is the only one who is going to stand before you and you are going to kneel before Him on a day of judgment. There's not a single person on this earth who has that power over you. There's not a single person on this earth who wants you to be able to kneel before Him and have Him say, well done, good and faithful servant. He wants that for you. He wants to say that to every single one of us. And too many times we let life's struggles tear us away from what we know to be true. Don't let that be today. Don't let that be your future. Be the one who trusts completely in God, who is comforted by the fact that at just the right time, He is going to be there for you and He is going to say, your name. He's calling you by name right now. Are you listening to the Holy Spirit right now? Are you seeking Him with everything that you have so that you can know His love for you? Are you saying yes to Jesus in every area of your life? Even in the areas that you have no control over because you can't change your friends, you can't change your spouse in your own strength and in your own power, you can't change your children in your own strength and in your own power. Only the Holy Spirit can have the power to do that. So all you can do is pray. Be comforted in the fact that that weight is off of your shoulders. That it is God who will do that work in them. You have a role to play, but again, it's Him directing you to that person, to pray for that person, to be there at just the right time when they are in their moment of need, and you are standing before them, and they say, you have lived a life that I can see you truly believe in this God. But if you're a whitewashed tomb, if you're really living a life contrary to what you say you believe, you've lost the ability to witness. You've lost the ability to, to speak into someone's life. God's going to do the work. Just be willing to be used as a tool of Him. And say yes in those areas. Let's stand together. If there is a if there is an area of your life where you have not said yes to Jesus, could you come and pray today? If there's an area of your life where you know that you were trying to do everything in your own strength and your own power. Would you come and give that to Jesus today and say yes to Him? So many of us don't want to be hypocrites, but our lives' actions, our life's actions, prove that we are sometimes. Give that up to Him today. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray in the power of the Holy Spirit that You will begin speaking to each one of us today, that You will open our hearts and minds so that we can be honest with ourselves, so that we can look at our lives truthfully and say yes to God, yes to Jesus. 
knowing that it's going to change things about our lives, knowing that it's going to cause us to uh, give up some things that we want. It's going to cause us to lose some things that we think we have to have. Holy Spirit, would you come and be powerful in the hearts and minds of everyone in here today? Speak to us. Continue to speak to us. I know you are here right now. And Lord God, would you comfort each one of us? There are hurting people in this room right now, Heavenly Father, and they need to be comforted. They need to know that you are calling their name right now. You're speaking to them. And that you want them to be able to kneel before you on the day of judgment and you can say, well done, good and faithful servant. Because they submitted to you and they said yes to you. Heavenly Father, we love you, we praise you. We give you all the glory and honor and we thank you for the level of comfort that you do provide us. It is better than any comfort we could find in our own strength. Help us to truly realize that, Lord God, and to truly seek you out in everything that we do so that we can know how much you love us. Lord God, I pray this all in your wonderful and holy name. Amen. Lord Smith, allow us to have a great day.